It's a pleasure for me, of course, um, to, to introduce uh, Heather Conley. Who I had a, a big pleasure of uh, teaching a long, a very long time ago, and to and to be colleague of. And um, Heather has worked in a um, couple of uh, universities in the UK before moving. Uh, last uh, last year to Grenoble, uh, to France, and her work is extremely interesting in a number of fields. I will just mention the, the three most important ones that can be interesting to many of us in our in our faculty. Uh, first, she was one of the first to take seriously the nature of radical trade unions, and she compared the French and the British radical unions, and uh, she put on the research agenda something that was dismissed generally by uh, traditional uh, labor studies and industrial relations. I think uh, in Italy in particular, we have quite a lot to study in that, in that regard. Um, the second aspect is uh, migration, uh, the study of migration and work and migration and trade unions in, the, in, uh, in particular, in different countries, in comparative ways, a very uh, deep and, and thoughtful uh, uh, studies. And the third one is methodological, uh, is about the idea of slow comparison. And maybe if we have time uh, at the end of today, we'll uh, try to update that, 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 those ideas, those methodological ideas about the importance of uh, <clears throat> taking the time to really understand uh, uh, in an embedded way, let's say, the, 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 how, how things are discussed and, uh, and uh, lived in different countries, how this can be updated to a pandemic situation. In our faculty, mo most of our researchers and PhD students do some sort of comparative work and uh, the way of doing slow comparison where you can't travel but you can't do the natural thing of uh, embedding yourself in a different society in the natural uh, traditional physical way is uh, is obviously an interesting uh, interesting point i think it's still possible to do it but certainly certainly it's it's not uh, it's not the same and it's not, not something which could be predicted let's say a couple of years ago uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased that Heather has, uh, has accepted to, to present her work on uh, um, the um, Gilles Jaune. I, I remember when, when uh, Heather had started the work, which I think the, the last seminar I was at in, in Britain before leaving was actually by, by Heather on, on presenting the beginning of the research because the, uh, the, the, the Gilets jaunes were, were very fresh at the time. Now I read uh, in her paper that not much has been going on uh, in, in recent times, but that probably allows to, uh, uh, to um, uh, present, let's say, findings and reflections in a more, uh, in a more complete way and uh, in a uh, slightly detached way because uh, presenting something in movement is always uh, is always a bit sensitive and uh, uh, and, and dangerous if you get it wrong. Uh, so I'm uh, the, the presentation is uh, about forty minutes. We are uh, no more than that. We, we try to not to um, make it too long, especially because of this unfortunate you know format uh, and uh, the online presentation is a. Uh, uh, a bit um, less uh, easy to fall off than uh, a physical one. I hope, of course, that one day we we'll manage to invite her uh, to, to Florence for uh, maybe a workshop on one of these uh, three very important research um, um, areas of expertise of her. But while we wait for that opportunity, we have to, it's already good to, 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 to have this opportunity online and then we have a discussion and then we have uh, some uh, some questions is that okay yes great so do you want me to share my screen if you um, manage yep yeah, yep yeah. so what i do is i'm going to share my screen and if because i won't be able to see you after that i apologize for um uh so just let me know when i'm up to time um so I'll just try and do this. Uh, I did have um, 
Hang on. Sorry. Mm. You should just... click uh, on uh, present now, the little arrow. Okay, that's fine. Yes, so can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. We now see, uh, we don't see the, 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 the one beginning. slide. Okay. Uh, if you can enlarge it, it's probably more readable because the, it looks like there is quite a lot of yeah, text. Sure. Okay. But, but you have managed to share the, the screen, that's fine. Okay. Apologies, it's not, uh, um, it's sharing the wrong part of my screen. Da -da -da. So what can you see now? You can't see my full, you can see my... We, we can see basically your PowerPoint uh, page. Okay. And if you click a partir du début, uh, I probably it will it will be fine. The only problem is, is I've got two screens. So what I'm going ah, to do uh, uh, is <laughs> I'm going to uh, stop the uh, screen sharing. So um, uh, apologies. So, ah, uh, really sorry. This is always a problem, isn't it? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm, if you can see that okay, it's not letting me put it on my laptop screen and I can't take the plug out because of the, um, so is that gonna be okay for you to see that? Probably, we may struggle maybe to read some, no, no, no it's better, no, it's fine. No, no, it's, it's okay. already, already better because you have one slide. Uh, yeah, okay, so apolog apologies for that. I probably should have. I thought we'd worked out the technology yesterday, so I apologize, apologize for that, but I don't want to take up too much time um, uh, doing that now. Okay, so thank you so much for that lovely introduction, uh, Guillermo, and thank you so much for inviting me to present here today. So this is some work I've been doing recently. As uh, Guillermo said, I, I need to place some caveats because my research is very based on an in-depth engagement into uh, the, the union movement and with the participants that I'm researching. And obviously I arrived in January, 2020 to the, 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 the pandemic, which cut off all those access um, that I had intended to participate in, participating in uh, hanging around and roundabouts and, and talking to uh, Gilets Jaunes activists. So this is <clears throat> the fact that we're developing both conceptually and we hope long term to explore more about the evolution of the movement in terms of some in-depth empir empirical research. So as, Gu as Guillermo introduced me, my work looks at trade unions and my background is very much from a uh, sort of a classic, if you like, British empiricist um, uh, background. Uh, my focus has been looking at trade unions and industrial relations perspective and has evolved from looking at radical political unions to how trade unions have responded to new challenges like migration, austerity. And also in France, I'm currently working on, and it might be useful to, to bring this into it, into the analysis. I've been looking at uh, a project evaluating the impact of President Macron's ordinance or his re labor reforms from 2017, which has had a, an impact in how I've, I've looked at the, the movement here, the Julie Jones, so it gives me a different kind of perspective and insight. So the title of the presentation today is um, the, we all stand together or do we, the messy process of building and maintaining collective action in the Julie Jones movement. So I hope you'll indulge me a couple of minutes to talk about the genesis or the origins of the paper, because with my co-author, um, we have been exploring this, uh, an ongoing dialogue between organization studies and industrial relations. And origins of my interest in the Gilets Jaunes came from a paper I was asked to present celebrating 20s of John Kelly's mobilization theory book. So this book was uh, very important in my academic development. It framed my PhD work on French trade unions. So the paper I printed was looking at whether unions 
uh, were being placed by social movements as uh, a way or a dynamic force for advancing workers' interests. And what I argued in that presentation was that union movements have shared interests and shared forms of action, and that a key way that social movements and unions have worked together is through fusion and absorption uh, of coalition building within trade unions, so women's committees, black members group, in the case of the UK, having this uh, absorption of different types of social movement interests within the union movement. And this has often been, as industrial relations academics talk about it, through a slow cumulative process of change within unions. So at the time that I presented the paper that Guglielmo is talking about, the uh, Gilles Jeanne movement had just kicked off. And what sparked interest <clears throat> for me is that it made me question my argumentation around these possible fusions between or alliances between unions and social movements. Because what we saw was a complete rejection of the uh, the unions by the, the Gilets Jaunes movement, so the participants in the Gilets Jaunes movement. So even though throughout the initial uh, demonstrations and in evidence that has come from the roundabouts, there has been some rapprochement, some uh, softening between the, the unions and the, the actions, mainly links with the, the CGT and calls for joint action, there is still a high level of suspicion and rejection from the Gilles Jones of being co-opted by political parties and trade unions. And this is all sides of the union spectrum, whether it's the more radical Sud Solidaire or the more reformist CFDT, this is all sides of the union spectrum. So the seed was planted for me to, to work out what was going on, how it destabilizes my arguments around alliances between unions and social movements. <clears throat> and so meeting with Anne Anthony in Grenoble in January 2020, she was starting to look at conceptualizations of solidarity uh, it, as it relates to organization studies. So <clears throat> we entered into this dialogue through the first few lockdowns around the what the Gilets Jaunes, the, we could uh, take from that and how we could conceptualize that from an organization studies perspective and a labor studies perspective. And we were looking, we were both looking what was missing from each of our disciplines. So from labor studies, industrial relations, Anne argued that there was this, what was missing was this focus on a moral uh, base of, of, of how injustices, are, sort of the emotional, how injustices are formed through this emotional sense of injustice that uh, comes from different types of moral arguments around what is seen as an unjust situation. And what I felt was missing from organization studies of, of collective identity and solidarity was embedding it within the political, economic and social context within which this solidarity is, it, and collective identity is formed. So the paper that I've given you is very, very early draft. It represents a, a dialogue between us. And also we have we've split off in our own directions. And my paper is more about uh, what we can contribute to the industrial relations or these notions of uh, more of how movement is embedded within the political, economic and social uh, context and what it means, what its potential meanings are for uh, collective action, understanding collective action and potential alliances with trade unions. So the presentation is, as you can see it here, I'm going to uh, spend some time uh, talking about the puzzle of the Gilets Jaunes from different perspectives. I'm going to set up some bases for solidarity and collective action that we've tried to interpret and understand the movement, drawing on recent work by uh, um, Glenn Morgan and Valeria Polignano, looking at the different factors which, which undermine or reinforce solidarity and collective action. <clears throat> So the Gilets Jaunes, who is us, so central to a discussion around collective action, collective identity, is who is us and what do we share with others, who is them and why now? So I'm going to go through that as the, as the case study. 
and then make some reflections on the moral, political and performative features of the movement and then pose some questions of, of, of what is next. Okay, the puzzle of the uh, movement. I've just realized I can probably work out how to, so I can actually see you here. Can you, sorry. Um, I've just realized what I can do to, to do that and then go to this and then there we go yes it is uh, it is better in the meanwhile okay. while we are on, on the technicalities your voice is perfectly loud and clear but there seems to be a little technical problem with the mic and there is some noise i don't know whether it is either the mic is uh, is moving or shaking or you are when you when okay. you when you move your hands maybe it gets touched the voice is perfectly loud and clear but sometimes there is a a, a mic uh, noise okay i'll try and if it please do interrupt and tell me if that's um but, but we did we did hear everything we did hear okay. everything only there was a bit of background Okay, so I just to go back to start with the puzzles of the Gilets Jaunes. So in terms of the difference of perspectives that we get on the, the Gilets Jaunes, it's been analysed from a, a lot of a variety of different perspectives. And we can draw and reflect on these different analyses and questions the movement poses in different disciplines to get a more holistic sense or a holistic sense of the movement and its possibilities and limitations. So there's an emerging body of literature, but there isn't much out there, right, analyzing the, the, the Gilets Jaunes movements. You might have your own sources that you can help me with, which I'd be very grateful with. So one of the comments made by sociologists and social movement scholars has been, and I've got some references at, at the end of the presentation, is that when the movement emerged, journalists uh, we're trying to look for experts to make sense of the movement. And the dominant trend was to have historians and philosophers talking about the Gilets Jaunes movement. No sociologists or social movement specialists, were, uh, because they were, as some sociologists argue, busy collecting data, busy sort of getting engaged within the movement, but not quite willing to to talk about the movement and start to interpret it and define it at a too early a stage. So this led to a gap in the media representation of the movement, a lack of a social movement perspective, and maybe we could argue a sympathetic portrayal of the Gilles Jaune movement. If you think about the support from Pierre Bourdieu in the 1995 uh, strike actions and the movement in 1995, there was no sort of engaged intellectual uh, supporting or the strong voice supporting the movement and this of course represent uh, ref, uh, led to a particular type of representation and contributed to the movement being uh, the, the media being targeted uh, as one of the as, as, as sort of divulging just proper, proper presenting the movement as a form of propaganda um, as fascist and right wing because that was the main representations within the media so there's this interesting uh, dialectic between the, the, the media representations and the evolution or the shift in the targets uh, of, the, of, the, of the Gilets Jaunes movement. But overlapping these questions, which were just notes that I wrote down from all the different readings that I did, because I've been searching from history, geography, politics, sociologists, organizational behavior and industrial relations to see what they've all tried to how they've tried to interpret the movement. But what's overlapping is trying to get some kind of sense or the questions, an implicit or an explicit sense of, of who they are. So who is the us? Who are, who, is the, the, who are they against? Who is the them? And what do they want and why now? So I'm gonna address these questions. But before I move on to presenting some of the, the who they are, I just wanted to give you an idea of the types of the, the conceptualization we've we've used to interpret or discuss or use as a sort of a heuristic device to talk through our, what we found about the movement. So we've looked at so we've drawn from Glenn Morgan and Valeria Polignano's work to 
help us make sense of, of, of the different forms of solidarity within the movement and how they can help us to understand the strengths and the limitations or the strengths and the weaknesses of the, of the movement. So they identify solidarity as a set of drawing on Put Putnam ideas of uh, around bridging and bonding processes which are embedded in moral political um, moral discourses political coalitions and social performances so this notion of sort of the bonding and the bridging elements of social capital are, are key to to this understanding in that the bonding elements in social capital emphasize the similarity within the group and the strength that this gives the group to act together. So what is the, the similarity? Who is the us? What do we share? And the bridging of the social capital refers to the ability to network across different groups uh, with some but limited commonality. So here you could think about those alliances with, with trade unions and political parties. So while the bonds that tie these groups together may be weak, so the moral community, the bridging provides strength, um, extending possible networks of information, collaboration and co cooperation beyond those potentially isolated moral communities. So what they argue in their work is that the more the moral, political and performative elements of solidarity overlap and reinforce each other, the more potentially powerful such movements can become. Similarly, the less connected the forms of solidarity, so the moral, political, social uh, performance, the more likely different forms of solidarity will clash and undermine each other. So what we liked about this conceptualization is that it allowed for a dynamic interpretation and discussion, uh, combining especially the performative elements, so the symbols, the rituals were so key to this particular movement, so the yellow vests, and I'll talk about that now as we go through. But the importance of collective identity in terms of defining obviously is both inclusive and exclusionary depend, depends on the definition of us uh, from them. So collective identity is obviously at the heart uh, uh, of, of, of this discussion um, and what, that, what makes that definition of us distinct. So finally, I, I'm hoping some of you have seen this film, this wonderful film by Gilles Perrette and François Ruffin. Uh, I can highly recommend it. So it's Je veux du soleil. And here you get uh, an insight. So it's a more sympathetic portrayal of who the Gilets jaunes are. It's, it's very much about interviewing the Gilets jaunes on the roundabouts um, and giving them voice in this film. But to give a background, I don't want to assume that everybody knows about the Gilets Jaunes movement. I presume as the school that you are, that you all do. But I just want a brief summary of the movement. And also, just in case I don't have time to finish the presentation, I'll hopefully have covered all the basis. So to give some background, the Gilets Jaunes started in 2018 as a protest against a, a planned fuel tax rise which the president Emmanuel Macron insisted would aid the country's transition to green energy. At the time, the polls suggested that the price of fuel was becoming a key concern for French citizens. Now, the emergence of the collective identity was initially facilitated by the focus on the fuel tax rise, which resonated with a diverse group of French people online and led to collective actions and protests. Now, I don't necessarily go into this, the online side of it, but obviously it's, a crucial, it's crucial to the emergence of the movement at the start. And we can talk about that in the discussion. So what is, is key here is that the state, specifically Macron, was attributed directly with the blame for the fuel tax rise. And after several weeks of protest, the government backed down on the fuel tax rise. So the movement was, but the movement has been interpreted as it has evolved as a wider vehicle, as a, as a vehicle for a wider set of grievances, sometimes contradictory, 
um, but also anger directed at the state, which has led to recurring protests which are still ongoing. I bumped into uh, someone in a yellow vest as I was taking my kids to the swimming pool yesterday and she has a camper van near a, a roundabout. And my husband said to me that I should go and uh, interview and that we're allowed out. Uh, so, so there is a, a recurring, the recurring appearance of yellow vest uh, on a Saturday morning, so this ritual is still continuing. But obviously, the the extent or the, the the level of participation has declined significantly, which I will I'll, I'll show you in a second. And what has been shown is there's been this dissipation and this division into potentially sort of multiple collective identities of gilets jaunes in the longer term and by region and uh, if you look at the social media uh, accounts and the Twitter accounts and the Facebook accounts you've got the Catholic Gilets Jaunes, you've got based on region, you've got a different identity formations on different sort of moral or identity bases that have emerged. So a messy movement right so that's why so it's a messy a messy movement but what do what we see in their self identification is that they identify themselves above all as the people so and work that has been done in new left review by um Kavlakis talks about this idea of the the unan unanimity of the Gilly Jones is of a different order from other movements as it arises from a dimension of their identity that is not identifying as a movement but as the people so this is a significant uh, a part of the uh, of understanding the movement is that if you think about it's the people so then the people can only be unanimous and we can see this in the evidence of uh, the speaking of people speaking out in the demonstrations so in Paris on the 15th of December 2018 one of the gilets jaunes spoke on the steps of the Opera de Paris uh, this movement does not belong to anyone and to everyone. It is the expression of a people who for 40 years have seen themselves deprived of everything that allowed them to believe in their future and their greatness. So they have been accused of being fascists or anarchists, of special instruments for political parties, apolitical, um, um, sophisticated haters. So if you read some of the political interpretations of the movement we see this range of different identities in the mediatization of them and i'll talk about where that has sort of emerged uh, from and why that is the case a, a, a bit later but nothing sticks so none of these attempts to interpret or define the movement as sort of fascist or right wing sticks they are openly and unreservedly admit their plurality and their diversity. But who actually are they? So several different studies that I've tried to draw on, some of them are qualitative, ongoing studies, some of them are interviews, stu survey studies. So in a T18 study, you can see the makeup of the, uh, the um, Gilets Jaunes movement in terms of what kind of profile that they are. And some some authors or some polemics around it have talked about how they are, there is a dominant profile. So as you can see here, the majority are either inactive, so unemployed or retired, employed, service sector workers. Um, so there's a, a dominant profile, what Maillard calls the office worker or invisible workers. So curries, building workers, care workers main private sector living in peri-urban or rural spaces. And an example here of a study um, by uh, that's referenced at the end is the example of Leon. And here you see the diversity range of, uh, of activities that the Gilets Jaunes have. So from union militants who don't understand why they're uh, union doesn't support the movement at a national level. You've got agricultural workers, teachers, library workers, building trade workers, security guards, delivery drivers, young precarious workers, and above all, a lot of women. So we see in this movement, what is a defining um, element of this movement 
is the is the is the fact that there is the high level of, of women in the movement. So as you can see here in this in this graph, there's a lot to take in from this graph. But what I want to, to take from it is the, the the high level of participation of women within the um, uh, movement, and um, and and the importance of, of of women actually in the emergence or at the start of the movement in online videos and actions and online actions such as petitions and speaking to local and national media. In terms of age, I'd be careful about the age because I see various different breakdowns of uh, uh, of the age. But some of the key things to take from this are. The geographical location. So we are talking about people who live, and what it terms here, the diagonal or divide, so the empty diagonal in the in in France that crosses lots of rural or semi-rural peri-urban territories and small towns and uh, villages. But what is significant from this graph is that three out of four have to use a car to every day in order to be able to go to, to get to work. And this is where the fuel tax came, arguably came in. Other areas to, to, to try and identify who they are is sort of 80 percent don't have confidence in the, the president. 75 percent don't trust political parties. Who did they vote for? 29% voted for Marine Le Pen in the 2017 first round of elections. And there was a high level of abstentions as well. In terms of their economic... Hada, sorry, Hada, yeah? sorry, if you click on Arrête le partage, yeah. we can see my, my political sociology colleagues... Oh, no, no, sorry, no, I, I miss... Uh, no, I, I, it's my fault. I, I asked you to click the wrong thing. There was one, one bit where you can delete the little box and we could see better the screen. And there was the box... Uh, it's my fault. Uh, no, I, I it's fine. You. It's not a right to the partage, which obviously which you had to click. It was something uh, to, 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 to remove that box because it covered part of the slide. And my political sociology colleagues certainly wanted to know who the uh, yellow vest vote for. Um, <coughs> Guglielmo, se c'è Valentina, ci può. Yeah, we can start. Yeah, yeah, now it's starting again. So uh, uh, it's. Um, I'm here, but. Yeah, yeah, now it's getting back. Yeah, good, okay. good. Yeah, there is no, sorry, it's not a vote. Can you see that now? Maske, yeah, that, that, that's the one, that's the one, yeah. But can you see that now? Yeah, no, but if you click maske, we can also see one bit which is now covered of the slide. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry, 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 hey, sorry. Thank sorry. you very much. I'm that was so sorry. <coughs> thank you. And, and, I, and while we're talking, did you see this one? Did you see this slide? Um, it went through a bit quick. Um, okay. I saw this one. I mean, if I, you, Hannah, if you can share the slides at the end, because yes, I'm sure there course. are some colleagues who are really interested in that and they want also the references and the details. But don't worry okay. now, it was very clear, the presentation was very clear even without slides. Okay, so, um, so I just realized I probably didn't click this one, but here you can see, as I was saying, this self-definition of the people and the types of, of, of workers that they are. And of course, I will share the slides and um, uh, I'm having anybody to have the paper. So as I said, mainly working sort of the dominant uh, profile, but here is a, an attempt to give a sort of an overview um, in a, an opinion or a survey study. But again, being careful about, about statistics as, 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 as always, but some of the qualitative studies that I've, I've, I've read have backed uh, this up that, that their economic situation means that they live below the um, so 65 percent uh, have difficulty living off their earnings they learn less than the average um, income and they have to drive a car for work they live in rural peri-urban or semi-rural communities and they don't have confidence in political parties. Also, and I think this is interesting in the middle, this état d'esprit, so 
their state of mind is 87% feel that they live in an, an unjust society. They believe that uh, taxes are useless and have a fear for their purchasing power and the future of France. So you make of that what you will. But here is a couple of quotes from the website, which I think really interesting because there has been several iterations of the website that has was uh, by region and there was two separate uh, websites. And now there is a coordinating website that has, that has managed to come together to provide a space for the different regions, the different departments, the different general assemblies as a central organizing platform. Now we could start to talk about the formalization and institutionalization of the movement here in terms of its trajectory, which could be an interesting, have we looked, have we seen the particular, a particular phase of development of the social movement? And now what we're seeing is a sort of a classic trajectory of formalization. But what we see in the on the formal the, the 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 website is that it's not part of a political uh, organization. It doesn't it doesn't seek to be representative. It doesn't have leaders, and in spite of everything, common will remains the struggle to survive with dignity and demand that is highly federative, so decentralized and and bottom up. And what I think is particularly interested here, nobody has the authority to assert the position of the movement. Nobody has the authority to claim support for the movement, whoever it is. So even the, they make it clear that even the people who are running the website don't have the authority on the movement. Now, I'm not expecting you to read this slide. I've just put it here as a, a piece of evidence, if you like. So this is the extent of the, 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 the growing list of demands of the movement. So you can sum them up uh, as being about fiscal, social and ecological justice. And I know at your university, you focus a lot on the political representation side. So what does it mean for political representation and democracy? And obviously that is peppered throughout these particular demands. So as you can see here, you can pick out so end of privileges for elected representatives. You've got a fight against media concentration. You've got an act for ecology, so for climate justice, fight against tax evasion, reinstatement of the inheritance tax, a preference for rail to road transfer, renationalization, uh, stopping the impoverishment of rural areas pensions right up to uh, more respect for animals so in this long and growing list we have all these different sets of demands but what is what is there what is what unites them so even on the on the website and you talk to people so this is more anecdotal but supporting the movement but in the initial phases of what i've been doing is what you see is this constant referral to um, the citizens referendum. So, so rather than, uh, so whilst they have all this, the list, what holds them together is this unifying demand or this common demand of most of the gilets jaunes as, as, a, as to obtain uh, a real democracy that they call. So as you can see, it's about being able to have more of a voice, more of a say, more of a representation in the political process. And just a couple of other interesting sets of data. So here you can see, are you part of the Gilets Jaunes? So the, the movement has had widespread support. And even though only 13% in this survey were part of the Gilets Jaunes movement, you see a high level of support for the actions uh, and the demands of the movement. Uh, so a majority are either participating or are part of the movement. And again, here is another piece of evidence that you can use to see the, the, the decline in the participation. And this is only up until mid-June 2019, but in other graphs I've seen the, there's similar sort of decline in terms of participation. And more recently in the 20 May Day demonstration 2021, the statistics say that there are around 2,000 Gilets Jaunes participants in the May Day cortege this year. 
And so who is them? So who is them? So President Macron has been the main uh, target for the, the movement. The, so the prime target has been sort of le peuple et Macron. So it's constantly this them and us. So it's us, you know, the people against uh, Macron and against governments, politicians and the elites, so the, uh, the elite representations uh, within politics and institutions. Another target, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right hand corner on my screen, is that pas de syndicat, so no unions. So this is not a union demonstration. And I think that was quite a sort of a, a visual, an interesting visual symbol of, of, of who they seek to, 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 to be defined, not co-opted by the trade union movement. So them is also institutions who haven't represented the people. The mainstream media, uh, is seen to be sort of propaganda, especially in how it's presented the movement. But also another interesting feature of the movement has been the violence. Now, I'm not going to go into much detail about the violence, and I'm happy to have a discussion about that. But I wanted to focus on um, because uh, then we could start talking about symbolic violence, right? You know, so you could start talking about what forms of vi symbolic violence within capitalist systems. But here we have seen an attacking of representations of, of, of inequality like luxury shops and the image of a, a burning Porsche and shops along the Champs-Elysees. And, but this wasn't about attacking the employer. This was not about attacking the employer. This was about attacking uh, the, 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 the state and the government who facilitate this trajectory, this, this, the march towards neoliberalism and um, inequality within uh, the country. And why now? So why have we seen this? What has been the, 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 the trigger for this? Obviously, we can talk about the role of social media. We can talk about the fact that that gives people uh, a platform to be able to voice their injustices, which can create uh, this this moral outrage that can lead to physical the, the the physical representations in terms of demonstrations and other actions. But thinking about uh, levels of inequality, we've seen risings of inequality in in France uh, in terms of contextual factors. Alongside that, we've seen increasing precarity within the, the, the labor market, we've seen the privatization of the pushing through of the privatization of the SNCF, for example, so the breaking up of, uh, of, 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 of strong sort of bastions of, of trade unions and, uh, and um, uh, people with sort of status within the labor market. So this sort of pushing through of liberalizing, so the state-led, in the words of Baccaro and Howe, we could talk about this state-led liberalization, which has led to a, a, a rising precarity within the labor market. So what they share is, uh, you know, why now is this, uh, this, this sense of inequality or the attack on their material conditions, which makes it difficult, as they say, to make ends meet at the end of the month. Now, why now? So this lack of trust, I'll be about another five more minutes, okay? So just to give you the heads up. <laughs> So why now? So a lack of trust in representative institutions. So in this 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 survey, it's well this lack of representation. So not being seen to be represented within these institutions. So trade unions fare particularly badly in this study, and they're seen increasingly as social managers rather than representing uh, representing working people. So the the complete um, absence of trade unions in a lot of the sectors and occupations that I mentioned earlier also leads to this sense of uh, sort of lack of trust in trade unions being able to represent normal working people or working class. Now, one of the key explanatory features or factors of the movement has been that what it was, it was predicted by geographers who start who were arguing for this. Uh, there was this confrontation between what 
uh, Christophe Ducols, uh, France Périphérique. So those who were based in uh, medium-sized towns, rural areas where there are there's the, the, the not dynamic employment areas. So there's employment that's leaving uh, these types of towns, which means that people struggle to, to, to live from the work that they do, to find work, and it costs them a lot of money by having to commute, etc. So they're the losers of this march towards uh, neo uh, neoliberal um, policies. So does it reflect this confrontation? So is this why now? This is the sort of a peak of, of a confrontation between the, 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 ta the towns and the cities or the rural or the peri-urban. Um, and this has been increasing and it was uh, made visible through the social media platforms and people started to stop victimizing themselves and saying that it was their fault, but actually it was the fault of politicians who they no longer felt represented them. So just a few comments to, to tidy this up. It, as I said at the beginning, it's a messy presentation as well as a, a messy movement. So trying to interpret this movement is has been uh, a, a, an ongoing challenge. But coming back to the articulation and organization of solidarity as the interaction of moral frameworks, political calculations and coalitions, and understandings of rituals, symbols, and narratives of the movement. So the more that these overlap and, re and reinforce each other, the more potentially powerful the movements can become. So that's the argument by, um, uh, made here. So in terms of the moral basis, as I said to you, this notion of uh, of people. So it's a, it's it's about the people and people being able to live with dignity and respect as against the elite. So having voice and being partly represented within the political system provides the base. So it's not dominant, uh, sort of a classic identity around um, class, religion, national identity, but the people wanting to participate in a dignified way. So it's about injustice, indignity of the and the suffering of the people, rather than uh, coming from a particular religious or um, class-based analysis of society. Social media platforms, as I said, facilitated this moral outrage. And the calls for a citizens' uh, referendum has helped to build bonds in the movement as an overarching demand, so against the state and for more representation of the people. The bridging has been simple because anybody can be a diligent. If you put your yellow vest on, anybody can turn up a roundabout and will be welcomed uh, um, and not ask for their name or their membership or what their politics are. So, but the challenge here has been, and this is a key that we might want to talk about afterwards, is that this has been a problem for the for for for, for analysing the movement because actually it leaves them open to a variety of attacks and criticism as the media and others try to understand and comment on the movement because any comment by Julie Jeune could be taken as representative of the of the movement. So if you come up with a, uh, a more right wing or something that's uh, that's racist or homophobic or sexist, then that's taken as, as representative. And what I think is really interesting in some of the analyses is that actually in all social movements, trade unions, you find a variety, a spectrum of, of, of views, right wing, left wing views. So the problem with not having um, a, a defined sort of moral base or based on class, religion or uh, ethnicity or nationality, this representing the people can leave this, it's, it's an ambiguous, um, ambiguous moral base. So the political basis, so as I've, I've said throughout, there has been some rapprochement, but the pragmatism in the movement seems to be this unifying or rallying cry for a citizen's referendum and it overlaps and strengthens the moral base of the movement so it's it's pragmatic but also provides a, a moral base for the the movement which makes it its um strength uh in that sense because we enforce e each other 
but also is it the rejection of coalitions with political parties and trade unions is it also uh, uh, a weakness and that's something uh, we can maybe discuss now the performance of the uh, has been a key so the rituals and the symbols so as i said anybody who has a yellow vest can participate in the movement and the the sort of the occupying of roundabouts the symbolic um the the saturday morning demonstrations have entered into the collective memory of the participants and the symbols like i said of the the the, the clothing the yellow vest which makes for a key strength i would argue for the movement is this sort of the social side the regular demonstrations the 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 media tape mediatization of these symbols and the regularity of the of the rituals in the movement is a key strength but it also shows its fragility it makes visible its fragility because it and flows depending on um the strength of um the the, the context or the the um uh, the changing context within which it's based so I don't need to go into this week. I can just leave this here if you'd like to discuss, because I've already gone on for far too long. Um, if you'd like to sort of people can read this. But just one comment I'll make quickly is that there's a there's a, a questionnaire on the website, which is ask, which is open until August 2021, asking for where the union, where the movement should go what its next combat should be and what it should do next. So I think that's quite interesting, this formalization potentially, and maybe a more of a, uh, yeah, formalization and maybe trying to coalesce around a more, uh, a slimmer set or a fewer set of demands might be the outcome of this. Thank you, thank you, Hada. Uh, that was a uh, very fascinating, uh, big combination of ideas, uh, interpretations, and uh, fresh data images, and so on. Our discussant is Lorenzo Cini. If he's ready, yeah, I'm ready. Actually, uh, we are two: Lorenzo Cini and Andrea Felicetti. Yeah. But okay. I, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Andrea. No, no offense to you. But I, I can start as first. Uh, uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you a lot, Edel, for your uh, very nice presentation and also had uh, uh, enjoy a lot the, the paper. And more, more broadly, I also want to, as uh, also already Guglielmo uh, told you before, I also really loved uh, your, uh, you know, uh, trade, uh, radical trade unions uh, literature, especially I'm, a, I'm very supportive, I really enjoyed your uh, your paper on uh, uh, the comparison between uh, UK and, and uh, France was one of my, you know, source of inspiration of my recent, let's say, uh, path pathway towards this very uh, important literature. Yes, uh, so thank you for, for this. Uh, having said that, now I will play the role of the tough discussion, let's say, and uh, uh, Andrea will play the role of the, the good one. A nice one. Uh, I have uh, um, uh, basically three three comments to to to, to address, and uh, they are all uh, uh, let's say derived from one main I would say point that it seems to me is quite evident in the in the paper. Uh, especially, I will focus my uh, commentary on, on the paper as well as on your presentation. There, there are some similarities. Uh, the, the main point is that uh, I, I have noticed, and it's clear from your, you know, industrialization background to me, uh, that there is a, a slight mismatch, let's say, between your, your theory and the empirics. Uh, and this, let's say, slight mismatch, then uh, from this uh, mismatch, uh, three main clues or, let's say, uh, issues uh, might follow. Uh, the first one it is precisely yeah uh, the fact that you are you know basically you are employment relation and labor scholar and it's very you know uh, evident in the way you you frame and you start discuss 
the Lisa rule that you uh, consider as world file to be, you know, adopted for your uh, uh, empirical investigation. Um, to me, uh, I mean, the, the, it's not uh, uh, very clear uh, why in order to uh, investigate these uh, mobilizations that are mobilization uh, in the end uh, uh, related to you know uh, some issues that somehow can define as economic but they are not uh, totally you know uh, part of the labor context labor issues you uh, you need to use uh, uh, labor uh, labor studies it seems to me, and I'm, I'm quite indeed uh, agree with you when you, at the very beginning of the paper, you say that we should go more on uh, the framing and collective identity literatures that they are part of this sense of social movement studies. But I even also suggest you to, to go even more in that, in the, a new strand of, of this literature that is uh, uh, focused on emotions, uh, grievances, and anger as, you know, key determinants or triggering factors of processes of identity formation, then it seems to me that in this type of mobilization, these uh, you know, uh, uh, issue related to grievances, emotions, anger are much more you know, fitting in, uh, for, for the case uh, under investigation. Uh, the second point I would like to raise is that it's, it's a kind of consequence of the first one, as you, uh, you, you in the paper, you, you, you basically present, uh, try to you know, uh, identify uh, solidarity and collective action as you know, somehow it seems to me that you consider them as a synonym. Uh, I don't think that in the case under investigation, they might be considered as synonymous in the sense that uh, uh, if and I agree with, with, with this perspective. In the, in the case of uh, uh, in the workplace, you might see uh, solidarity uh, as a uh, you know, uh, determinant or part of a, a process of a collective uh, action or collective mobilization. And the other way also around might be you know, valid. So there is a kind of you know, conflation between the two uh, concepts. It doesn't seem to be the case that in the broad and context outside the workplace, we we can uh, uh, you know assume this uh, uh, similarity between these two concepts. So uh, again, uh, collective action uh, in uh, you know the broader social arena, as is the arena of of, of you know of play of, of this movement, is more the result in the case of an investigation, for instance, of social psychological dynamics related to the target of the protest, uh, specifically the rise of the price of fuel, triggering then uh, further processes of uh, mobilization and potential identification. Then, so the, the final then comment is also a little bit uh, overarching, also incorporating the two, is that I, I'm not sure then in the end that uh, this uh, mobilization uh, is about uh, uh, solidarity. Um, I'm not sure, in other words, that uh, in order to explain, make sense of this mobilization that are, you know, uh, arising around the contestation of this increase in the price of fuel, uh, we, we need or you need to build on the concept of solidarity and the rate of literature. Uh, in my view, uh, still, the, 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 these national traditions in uh, social movement studies looking out of the economic crisis because there were, we had also a epistemological break to uh, the role of uh, grievances anger emotions and so forth so for are in my view much more you know central to explain this mobilization that have been played uh, out in the in the in the, in the arena uh, outside uh, beyond the workplace and also beyond labor issues so uh, i have a list also of uh, references that I might uh, provide you with, as well as also I would like to, happy to, sh to share with you some other thoughts. And yeah, just uh, the, uh, concluding remarks, for instance, I had uh, Paolo Gerbaudo books when I was, we were speaking about uh, we, the people united, uh, the flag like the mass might be maybe a useful uh, work to, to look at also for, you know, uh, understanding this uh, phenomenon. But uh, many thanks for your very interesting presentation and for all your work and you have, uh, you know, 
uh, written and built over the last year. So thank you. I will uh, give the floor to Andrea. Okay. Uh, I, hi, Heather, once again, and hello to all the participants. Uh, I don't know whether you, Lorenzo, played the good or bad cop. In any case, you played the very thorough uh, uh, discussant, so I will be briefer. Um, first of all, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm familiar uh, with your work, uh, unlike Lorenzo and Guglielmo, uh, honestly, uh, but I share with you uh, the, the fact that I also approached uh, social movements coming from a different uh, background, in my case it's democratic theory, and I think it's always worth uh, trying because it can lead to, to original analysis. So I think this could well be the case with this paper once it's uh, more developed. Um, so essentially the paper, I will give comments on the paper rather than on the presentation that is uh, even broader. Uh, so I'll try to stick to what I read, and of course it's a, so your aim here is to understand you as you state whether uh, Yellow Vest was a success story, so to speak, when it comes to forging solidarity in the unfair, within the unfavorable context set up by neoliberalism. Uh, I think you blend a suggestive mix of industrial relations, organization studies, and social psychology insight. Um, this is very promising, uh, but uh, I will point out point at a few things that could be improved, perhaps. Uh, uh, overall, I think that the theoretical discussion, as it, it's featured in the paper, is a bit dispersive and not clearly linked to the empirical section, which is thorough, but might need to be further expanded, just because uh, it's uh, like really interesting. Um, so, um, more, more precisely, uh, something that Lorenzo has hinted upon, upon as well. So it's not immediately clear why you start your discussion with the, sub, with the field of labor relations. Now I understand, but when reading it, uh, I was a bit puzzled. So I'm not surprised by movements reject, rejecting unions, so to speak, but by someone using uh, labor um, studies lenses to analyze social movements, I think that calls for a couple of lines of explanation and then it's fine. Um, and then, relatedly, there is the idea of social classes that kicks in every now and then in your paper. That idea and its Bordesian uh, origins is clear, but it's not well embedded in the paper. So either you expand on it a bit more or perhaps uh, leave it behind. And then there are quite a lot of concepts. So in order for you to speak about solidarity, you also engage somewhat with collective action building and maintaining uh, and collective identity. Um, these are very broad of them of, of themselves. So maybe you want to choose which one needs to stand and which one needs to fall. And then there is your definition of um, solidarity. Um, put it put as you do as a feeling that comes and goes and is fragile and volatile. It's a bit too broad. Uh, I like your focus on the circumstances that are characteristic of solidarity, and I probably would insist uh, on that aspects on that aspect and uh, then just um, to finish up a few things there are here and there some big claims about uh, moral moral philosophy and social psychology blended together and i don't know if you need those uh, um, through the text sometimes it makes for quite a heavy uh, reading uh, like your your discussion about for instance the role of emotions and morality in solidarity I mean, that is interesting, but then it's somewhat lost uh, when you do your empirical analysis. So I would consider whether to keep it uh, or not. And um, was just one thing, you, um, you refer to the need to have a group as a reference for discussions about solidarity. But some recent events uh, make me think that solidarity can be very much targeted to an individual. For instance, a lot of the debate on Patrick Zaki um, is quite targeted to that individual, whom, of course, can be integrated in a broader uh, social group and, and activist scene. But as it's, I see very much tied to the individual. So I wouldn't exclude solidarity towards individuals, um, as you seem to suggest. 
And then finally, I really like your characterization of uh, three types of solidarity. And empirically, I think it's uh, um, an interesting uh, uh, road to explore. And uh, as a reader, I would like to see more or to learn more about that. So once again, thank you very much. And I hope this was of some contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I would um, suggest that Heather already takes the, the question from the discussant. And in the meanwhile, uh, I see that there are already some, um, uh, some people raising their hands or in the chat or, uh, or online. But uh, let's let take these this, this two first and then depending on the time, we'll take also the other ones where we may have to do it a bit, a bit more, more on, the, on the quick side. Okay, so thank you so much for your comments. They're really, really helpful. And neither of you acted as as, as bad cop. It's um, it's uh, a very early stage, and as I said, it's still a dialogue. And what's really interesting is the comments that you bring out. So I'll just draw out uh, some themes from the the, the comments. That actually, the origins of the discussion around. Uh, morality and the um, the morality and the use of solidarity was we were actually writing conceptual pace, paper on the dark side of solidarity because solidarity was being used by my employer, so a business school, you know, private business school in France. It was being used in the COVID pandemic that we all need to be uh, solidarity and and it was actually was continued to be used also it was used by politicians we all need to act in solidaire we need to be solidaire and we were actually trying to explore how to under interpret and understand some of the ways in which solidarity can be manipulated and so these dark features so that's why we went into such detail I suppose in trying to conceptualize this emotional sort of psychological response because actually it led to a lot of you know, as you can imagine, in terms of normative control and how people started to self-discipline because we were all we were accepting our conditions because we were in solidarity us against the pandemic. <laughs> so that's how we you know, it was us as 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 as, as people against the pandemic. So that's where originally we started to develop some of our conceptual ideas from. And then we decided that we didn't want it to be so much of a, a, a sort of a conceptual paper. But Anne has gone off to lead the paper around the dark uh, aspects or the, the way in which solidarity can be manipulated for productive purposes, if you like. So that was why solidarity. And actually, what you say is this conflation of concept, a conflation of terms, and you're absolutely right. And when I read back in my presentation in my paper this morning, I was kept coming back to this conflation between collective identity and solidarity. So, um, and that is something that, because I'm very uh, new to the concept of solidarity and thinking through, uh, and like you said the different forms of solidarity you know we've gone back to Durkheim we've looked at the evolution in terms of how you relate solidarity in terms of the the, the evolution of uh, of capitalist systems and and like you said it's interesting that you point out solidarity towards individuals we struggle to to reconcile solidarity as charity so is solidarity what is solidarity is it about a feeling and it just stops there or is it about engaging in some form of of, of action um, against something or for something so where does sort of charity or sympathy or a feeling of um, that feeling of solidarity is it does it just exist as uh, without any form of uh, of action or, or as part of a of a group but I, I liked what you were saying in terms of sort of thinking about, uh, can it be about an individual? Do you need the group in terms of when you're thinking about conceptualizing solidarity? So that's really useful to me. Like you said, there's lots of decisions we need to make about whether 
we look at it in terms of a board, you know, a Borgesian analysis around social classes and how it disrupts our sense of uh, or our understandings of, of or the fuzziness around group formation. So that is some decisions that we need to make. Also around collective action and, and identity, we need to sort of firm up that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I've taken on board this notion of uh, of talking about sort of anger, grievance, uh, uh, emotion, and why should it be, should we be drawing on more sort of social movement literature and how anger, grievances and emotion can help us to to, to talk through the movement rather than coming at it from a labour studies perspective. But I guess my aim was to engage with industrial relations to public, I guess, to talk to an industrial relations audience to be able to use concepts that were familiar to them. Because of course, I've worked a lot on social movement theory and and, and sort of the framings around injustices and, um, but maybe not to the references that you are talking about. So I'd really appreciate any references you have to share there. That would be really useful. But it's very intimidating to present to a, a, social, a school of social movement scholars. So. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll get some, some counter movement. Uh, that's, uh, that's good. Thank you, Hada. Uh, now, uh, Ricardo and Hans Jörg have already raised their hands. Um, so please, Ricardo. Hi, hello everybody. Thanks, uh, Heather, for this presentation. I'm very interested in the case of the Gilles Jeune, first of all. So uh, more than, uh, you know, specific comments, uh, I would like to uh, raise some questions regarding some curiosities I have, curiosities that are uh, both empirical, but also related to my field of expertise, which is more social movement studies. Um, I found... Uh, um, um, very interesting, but at the same time challenging, the, the use of a, a Bourdieu framework for explaining, let's say, a relatively uh, young uh, mobilization, since uh, uh, it's not a problem to use uh, some Bourdieuian uh, concepts for social movement studies. Uh, there is uh, plenty of scholars that do that, but usually in my uh, in my experience, uh, uh, the Bourdieu framework is really uh, a structural based uh, framework which uh, um, has uh, um, a powerful uh, potential for explaining genetic uh, historical changes so in, you know how fields emerge and they they adapt uh, they they innovate probably a specific uh, field like a political field so it is more on the long term while uh, it is difficult for example to explain the the, the rise of uh, new forms of uh, uh, class belonging or consciousness uh, in such a short uh, short term uh, so uh, this was the the first uh, uh, doubt that i wanted to share uh, with you because also i was partly uh, working on that uh, on some labor mobilization and i found it uh, problematic but i don't know if if you have uh, uh, some uh, further evidences that uh, probably could could help uh, uh, provide some uh, um, interesting insights regarding the, the use of some uh, of some uh, Bourdieuian concepts. Then, on the other hand, I have a, I have a, um, a sort of comment, suggestions regarding uh, a distinction that I haven't uh, uh, found in the in the presentation uh, between uh, um, the discourse uh, in how to to basically understand the discourse of the Gilles Jeune, because uh, it is true that they talk about the people, but it seems to me that is, it is more a, a strategic positioning rather than a real identity uh, belonging. I mean, talking about the people means uh, trying to uh, get a broader uh, consensus, to reach a consensus that include uh, uh, potentially all the participants, you know, and uh, so not excluding uh, categories. So it is more a strategy of, uh, consensus building rather than uh, a real identity. This is the, the same thing that happened, for example, uh, in Italy with the, the Five Stars movement, which was at the beginning a, a similar movement with similar frames, claims, but then get translated into a political parties because it had uh, also a company that helped uh, providing the resources to organize 
uh, candidates for the election, uh, um, a political platform, and so on. This seems to me that uh, in the French case uh, uh, was absent because uh, of uh, mainly the uh, political constraint of the electoral system or the way you know political innovation is created. So uh, I think that uh, probably this could be a, an interesting um, innovation. So try to to link. Uh, what you are saying about how the movement emerged and probably also uh, partly declined or the, it, it gets dispersed, uh, you know, in, in, in different categories. Because how did it, you know, find that political translation? Did it find, for example, as I, I saw in the slides, uh, potential already established parties that were able to innovate the repertoire, for example, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, we know that the recent election, he basically adopted a very nationalist uh, framework, trying to, you know, steal, let's say, the uh, working class uh, that had uh, a strong uh, national uh, identity to the uh, Marine Le Pen's, uh, you know, uh, electorates. So uh, in this sense, uh, you know, I I've seen that you have this uh, triangle of, um, uh, potential uh, political uh, opinions in the in the region that are very interesting uh, because you have sort of a thirty percent around of abstention. Then you have a more or less the same percentage for Marine Le Pen, and then a, a slightly uh, minor uh, support for a Mélenchon. I think probably looking at uh, the way uh, these frames and claims were incorporated by the existing political actors uh, could be useful, uh, or also potentially seeing how uh, part of the leaders that gained visibility, uh, they became potentially interesting for these, uh, these political parties uh, to be incorporated, you know, in saying uh, we have uh, with us new, new leaders and uh, uh, potentially, you know, uh, very attractive people that uh, uh, mobilize uh, uh, voters for for the election. So these uh, these are my mm, my main com mm, comment. And uh, I, I mean, for the rest, I I think it's a very interesting subject, and uh, I'm really looking forward to see how the your paper evolves. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ricardo. Hans, you We can't hear you. Uh, thanks to Hita for this uh, very informative uh, presentation. And I'm not a social movement scholar, so there's no reason to be scared. Uh, I was rather learning uh, from you about the state of democracy, actually. And this is also one question I wanted uh, to address to you. I'm interested from a kind of democratic theory perspective. What do we learn here? about uh, the state of uh, democracy uh, in uh, France. And you said that this is a messy uh, movement. And uh, being messy then uh, seems to imply uh, that uh, you were mentioning that you can, uh, that it is enough to, uh, to put uh, to put on a yellow vest and you are part of this movement, but then you can raise very opposite uh, claims. You can, um, uh, one would say that this is a progressive movement that encourages deliberative democracy. You were mentioning others uh, say that this, is a, that, that, that this is a populist movement that is interpreted as uh, standing uh, almost close to fascism. And uh, if you assess these two uh, very oppositional claims, you would probably find that both are true to, to a certain degree. And um, um, it, this, in a way, indicates uh, the problems uh, of the formation of a political opposition in democracy, I would say. So it links back to the institutional dimensions uh, of democracy that uh, are blocked in France, uh, but also in, uh, in, in, um, in other European countries. So uh, uh, from a neighboring perspective, one could, of course, claim that uh, there are many elements here uh, in the uh, Gilets Jaunes, which is uh, typical French. Uh, this, is a, this is a typical French form uh, of protest, but this would be maybe a, a, a little bit premature 
because then uh, there are also uh, many elements uh, in common where you can learn uh, from the French situation about uh, why um, democracy, why representative democracy here uh, is uh, blocked and what are the, um, uh, the, uh, the difficulties in the formation of a political opposition. And this messiness then, uh, ultimately, that, that, that would also be a question, uh, to you, whether uh, this messiness is not uh, also indicating the weakness uh, of this movement, which is the weakness uh, of the formation of a political um, of a political opposition. So, uh, being messy uh, is not necessarily an indicator for uh, for a strong and lasting movement that has an impact. And the evidence that you gave us. Uh, indeed, rather speak uh, for the failure of the movement than for its institutionalization. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wants to ask uh, ask questions? Uh, otherwise, I think we still have a few minutes. Um, I uh, last one, uh, a relatively uh, simple one, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a suggestion. Um, given how the paper is, uh, in a way you are speaking to social movements and solidarity, literature, and so on. And to avoid the question like from, uh, from Andrea, why, why, why do you put labor studies in, which is not a question I would ask, but what other people would, would ask, is that um, a possible extension of, uh, of this work is to compare uh, the, the Gilets Jaunes mobilization with the other important mobilization that occurred in France in the last few years, which were much more trade union based. And were the ones that about, about the labor market, the Atom Reload, the Macron uh, reforms, the pension reform. There were three big union mobilization around the same years. In the middle, there was the Gilets Jaunes, which had more uh, uh, media eco, but I would say uh, you know, the, 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 all four were. Of the same size and the same political importance, and 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 then really that there could be some interesting thing because they are all about injustice. But how the trade union mobilization explains injustice and how the Gilets Jaunes do and how different they are. See, that, that that really there will be a big contribution, and you are the best placed person because you understand both social movements and uh, and and labor movement to see what's the difference. That would be very interesting also outside France because there are similar trends. Um, uh, about 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 the future, I would say that maybe one thing that can be added is uh, the counter mobilization. That is, uh, the fact that Macron called that big grande bar national and so on was it, when it did. I thought, oh, Obama did the same in 2009 against the Tea Party, and they called all the town hall meetings and so on, and they didn't work. It was a disaster for Obama. He lost the 2010 uh, midterm elections. And I wonder whether the Grande Bar National uh, and, and, and the turn somehow of Macron towards a bit more dialogue than, than it was at the beginning, whether well, that has been, uh, that has had an effect. Uh, maybe, maybe not in comparison to the pandemic. Uh, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll let you answer, answer the, last, uh, the last two questions and then we we'll probably have to, to call, it, uh, call it a day. Okay. So thank you for all your comments. I might not um, cover them all, but I'll try and cover them as much as I can. In terms of coming back to the conceptualization using Bourdieu, uh, the main ways in which we tried to, or we wanted to use it, or we were exploring using it was in terms of the formation of, or sort of the fuzziness or the way in, uh, of group formations and how the religion sort of challenged our traditional sort of understandings of, of, of working class uh, notions of working class identity or, or, or group formation. But to be honest, we didn't go <clears throat> any further than that. Excuse me. <clears throat> we set up this, well, how do you explain that you've got uh, BMW driving, uh, you know, professional arriving with his yellow vest at the roundabout alongside homeless people and, you know, care workers, nursery workers. So how do you, what does that, how does that disrupt our understandings of uh, group formation and, and, and working class, understandings of um class 
analysis. So we didn't go beyond that. And the most likelihood is, is like you were talking about the emergence of fields and uh, how fields emerge. And we haven't really tapped into that uh, conceptualization. But as I said, we, as we're both coming from it, we're both exploring a field that we're not so familiar with from two different fields. So this is why I said this this sort of search for conceptualizing the the movement or trying to interpret the movement, what conceptual basis to draw on. This has been a really useful discussion for me, and I thank uh, you all for for bringing different elements, sort of from democratic theory to to looking at more sort of embedding it within more of the social movement literature. Right back to Guglielmo's point, which I'll uh, quickly say. We, we did actually um, start with a comparison of the sans papier movement and how the how the CGT had been trying to had absorbed the sans papier or the undocumented workers movement within how it there had been this fusion with these um, this social movement or this civil society movement within the trade union. So we did actually compare those two movements initially. And I think just listening to you, that would be very helpful actually in comparing, uh, like you said, those movements that arrived at the same time. So that's a really interesting um, suggestion and the way in which injustice is framed, the way in which collective identity has been framed, what are the grievances, um, what is the collective identity? Who is the us and the them? That might be a, a useful way of, uh, uh, of what's the word, uh, targeting the, the audience or the industrial relations or labor studies audience um, by comparing those movements. So that's interesting. In terms of the democracy question from Hans, um, uh, that's a really interesting question. Where have I put my notes? So what does it say about the, the, the state of uh, democracy? What I think is one interesting analysis that, that's coming from some of the political or talking about European democracy and what does it tell us about European democracy? And just one of, while you were talking, it made me think that um, what uh, one of the areas of sort of moral outrage or issues is that sort of Macron came to power not as part of a traditional political party. So he was sort of speaking to, so this sort of the, the, the expectations were set that this was someone who was going to be speaking to, to an individual who was going to be representing the people. And that was this deception that occurred from uh, his presidency was that uh, the individual became the key mobilizing actor here. So what we talk about is a collective of individuals in the Gilets Jaunes movement or a community of individuals rather than a collective. So it's trying to understand this, not in the collective uh, tradition, sort of giving up part of yourself. No, you, you are as an individual and it's bringing the role, the importance of the individual as Macron did um, in his electoral campaign, not, associating with a, 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 a traditional party but what does it say what does it what do we learn about the state of democracy you know right enough do we fall onto the the weak is it a sign of the weakness uh, of the movement um that it's dissipated but i guess that is where i find useful the conceptualization that i put forward in the performative elements of solidarity and how the ritual and how the category of the gilets jaunes now just as anecdotally it's like are the gilets jaunes coming back you know what are the gilets jaunes you know if we're talking about two thousand people or a few people on a roundabout in some cities in france the amount of media time or space that's been given to this category or sort of the, the gilets jaunes it's become part of the sort of the collective memory and the part of the, the the rituals within sort of French protest movements, if you like. So in a, in a, in a sense, by by coming from being defining themselves as the people, this this plurality and this lack of definition has provided its strength as a category, even if below it we don't actually see a mass. 
uh, group or movement underneath it. So yeah, so I think I probably haven't covered all of them, but I'd be happy to to, to make it. It was very, there. very, very exhaustive. Thank you, thank you, Heather. We we reached the time, so thank you again for sharing the the paper. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and and I'm sure the colleagues will also be happy to uh, to reply by email and, and send you comments on on specific points. So good luck with uh, with that uh, interesting work. It, it, it was nice for me to see the big progress in in this uh, year and a half, two years since I, since I saw the two years since I saw the the, the, the beginning of the talks about that. Um, and uh, yes, I hope we, there will be other opportunity to discuss parts of your uh, of your work. Here in Tuscany, we are more used to slow food than slow comparisons. But uh, one day, we maybe we managed to invite you and do both slow food and slow comparisons uh, here. So thank you to uh, also the discussion to Lorenzo and to uh, Andrea for the, uh, their good job for being uh, good and uh, and thorough as, uh, as it should be. We are not. We are, otherwise, we get a reputation of nasty people. That don't people don't accept our invitations? No, 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 no. That's You're that's great. that's how to do it. Uh, so okay. thank you, everybody. Manuela, do you have to say any, any single any organizational information that we need to pass on? Uh, no, the only the, excuse me, the only yeah. information is about the next uh, um, lunch seminar on the fourth of June. But however, since the speaker uh, is uh, now mailing us, uh, Michela and myself, for some problems, um, I will update you. <laughs> so. Okay. 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 We we'll, we'll wait. We we'll wait for the update. Thank you. Merci Thank beaucoup. You again, uh, for and, uh, uh, bon courage. Merci. Au revoir. Ciao. Ciao. Merci. Bye.